Welcome to the stage, Sir Cam Batley. Hello, I want to tell you that I am excited. I'm excited to be here in Israel, the birthplace of modern medical cannabis, the research leader, the place that produced Raphael Machulam. And I'm here to give you the good news about cannabis. First, a little bit about me. I am the chief corporate officer of Aurora Cannabis. We are, by different measures, the second largest cannabis company in the world, if you look at market capitalization, or maybe the largest cannabis company in the world, if you look at our global footprint. We're now we're operating in 24 countries. And the story of cannabis is of something happening fast, something good. It's what I would call a global megatrend. Cannabis, starting with the medical side, is sweeping the world. Now, what is a global megatrend? It's a significant and rapid change in society, in law, and business. And it's all for the good. What we're doing by creating a cannabis industry, not in a country, not in two countries, but around the world, is opening up and unlocking some very good things. The creation of legal, regulated cannabis is generating massive investment, huge economic spin-off benefits in the countries that legalize it either for medical or consumer purposes or both. Huge employment gains and massive innovation. It's also disrupting a number of existing mature industries. If you think about beverage alcohol, if you think about traditional pharma, it's disrupting these industries. And the last one is very interesting to me because I've been in the cannabis business in Canada for five years. I was with Canopy, the other of the two largest cannabis companies in the world for two years, and then three years ago, last month, I moved over to Aurora. And to give you a sense as to how fast things move, in three years since I joined Aurora, we've gone from 35 employees to 2,400 around the world. We had a market capitalization on the junior Canadian stock market, the Canadian Securities Exchange, three years ago of 70 million Canadian dollars. Today, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange and we have a market capitalization of about 10 billion US dollars. And it's just getting started. Now, I am not the first person you would think of to join the cannabis industry. I spent my whole career prior to this in the global biopharmaceutical industry. I started my career with Eli Lilly and have worked with companies like Pfizer and Bayer and Amgen and the World Medical Association. Pretty square guy. I'm also a scout leader for 10 years and a soccer coach for my kids for 10 years. They actually call me the squarest guy in the cannabis business. But let me tell you about the sense of mission that I feel about what we are doing. I may be a square guy, but I am passionate about our business. I'm passionate about what we can do in terms of creating wealth, of course. It's my job, in part, to look out for the interests of our shareholders, along with other stakeholders. Good capitalism, in my view, means you look after multiple stakeholders, not just shareholders, but your employees and society at large. And this is where the passion for what it is we're doing comes from. And it runs through me, and it runs through my colleagues. Everybody at Aurora feels this. It's a new kind of company with a practical idealism and a strong belief in the righteousness of what we're doing. On the medical side, we are opening up new alternatives to patients who have not been thoroughly satisfied by the results of traditional prescription pharmaceuticals. Perhaps they didn't get the relief of the symptoms that was required. Perhaps they couldn't tolerate the side effects. And now they've turned to medical cannabis 
and they've found that it works. This is not a disease-modifying therapy yet. I haven't yet seen the persuasive evidence that I need to to show that cannabis is a disease-modifying therapy, like a hypertension drug or a cancer drug. Cannabis thus far is used for the management of the symptoms of an incredibly broad range of health conditions. Ten years ago, if you'd asked physicians anywhere in the world what was the most broadly therapeutically useful substance, nearly 100% of them, I would say, would have named aspirin. And that makes sense. It has multiple mechanisms of action. You can use it to manage fever or pain. You can use it for anticoagulation. Today, physicians with clinical experience with cannabis would most likely tell you that cannabis is, in fact, now the most broadly therapeutically useful substance that they're able to employ. From pain management to spasticity from multiple sclerosis to intractable forms of epilepsy and bowel disease and certain anxiety disorders. The patients call it useful. And a point that I have to discuss with politicians, policymakers, regulators around the world is that we have to gain a certain comfort level with the unusual path of cannabis in becoming part of the pharmacopoeia. It's unusual. Unlike traditional prescription pharmaceuticals, it hasn't gone through phase one, two, and three clinical trials and then regulatory approval. It hasn't done that, but it's available in more than 40 countries around the world. More than 40 countries have created medical cannabis systems or are in the process of creating medical cannabis systems. It's happening. And it's happening because we're finally listening to patients rather than criminalizing them. Patients have been using medical cannabis for many years. They've been doing it underground. They've been buying it on the black market. They've been risking criminal charges, and in some cases and in some countries, even jail time. And they've been doing that because they knew that cannabis helped manage their symptoms. And one question that we have to put to policymakers, to the elected officials who make the rules, is when a patient tells you that their pain is less when they use medical cannabis, if the patient tells you that their anxiety is less, if the patient tells you that the symptoms of their bowel disease are less, whether we have the clinical trial results yet or not, don't you have to take the patient at their word? Don't we have to take them at their word? Because symptoms are subjective. Symptoms are the experience of the patients. They're the experts in themselves. They know when their symptoms are less. And we can do that with cannabis because it's such an unusual substance. Obviously, it's unusual in that there is a clear medical role for cannabis to play. And also, there's a role for cannabis as a consumer product for people who seek to achieve mild intoxication. That makes things complicated. I know it does. It does. It makes things complicated, but we can't be confused. We need to be rational, but we also need to be empathetic. And it is critically important to all the patients who are suffering out there who have not been able to manage their symptoms effectively through traditional prescription pharmaceuticals that we not let the stigma continue, that we not judge them because this is, in fact, a mildly intoxicating substance. And let us always remember the enormous safety factor associated with cannabis. We said it's an unusual substance, and it clearly is, but one of the most unusual things about cannabis is that you can't die from it. There is still no known level of lethal overdose with cannabis, and you can't say that about aspirin or Tylenol. You can't say that about opioids. There are those who would like to keep medical cannabis in a box and limit its usage. Obviously, I have an interest and a bias, and that makes me not one of those people. But I'd go further. 
I spoke earlier about the sense of mission that we had at Aurora. We want to carry an advocacy message around the world to make medical cannabis systems everywhere they're established truly accessible to patients. No country today has a perfect medical cannabis system. Canada's is pretty good. We have more than 400,000 patients with a prescription from their doctor in our system, and that's all happened in five years. Germany's is pretty good. Reimbursement for 70% of patients. Israel's is pretty good. Australia's is getting there. And new systems are opening up all the time, but we need to compare and contrast. We need to share best practices. Always in the, in the back of our mind has to be the central objective, and that is to help the patients. Keep the patient's interest first. Don't let the stigma hold us back. And then we have one more conversation that's going to come today. The focus of my company is primarily on medical cannabis. We are primarily a medical cannabis company, although we do sell, and sell a lot, in the Canadian consumer system as well. But these conversations have to happen. These conversations have to happen about removing the criminal prohibition on cannabis around the world. And I'll tell you why I feel so strongly about that. There's a cynical joke that's been around in Canada for some time that cannabis has been legal in Canada for years if you're white. Cynical joke with a major point. In Canada, and this is reflected in country after country after country, in Canada, the prior criminal prohibitions, the criminalization of cannabis, the impact on that fell primarily, disproportionately, on Canadians of color, indigenous Canadians, and low-income Canadians. What you had was a law that didn't work. Millions of Canadians, five or six million, were using cannabis on a regular basis. The law prohibiting cannabis didn't work. And not only didn't it work, it was unfairly and unevenly applied. To me, that's the very definition of law that needs reform. So, my last message to you Everybody in this room, all people of goodwill with your knowledge, if you're an activist, if you're a researcher, a scientist, a regulator, let's bear in mind that we can achieve a great deal of social good around the world by removing the criminal prohibitions on cannabis, on creating well-regulated, safe, and accessible medical cannabis systems for patients. We can do a lot of good, and while we're doing that, by God, we can create a lot of wealth. Investors will benefit. Employees of growing cannabis companies in Israel, in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, Latin America, Australia, Asia, everywhere. There will be new employment, new innovation, nothing but good. We don't open it wide instantly. We take our time. We make good public policy, but we achieve good public policy ends. And we always keep in mind the patients and the people unfairly harmed over the years by criminal prohibition of cannabis. So let's agree. Let's make up our minds. Let's make a pact together to do some good. Let's spread this message around the world. Thank you very much. Cam Badley, just throw the mic down, man. You nailed it.